Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 22nd, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on the national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you can also follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why the term surplus has become another step in the Orwellianization of Alaska budget terms. Second, we discuss what is driving the net outmigration of working Alaska families and why the Alaska anomaly isn't really an anomaly. And third, we ask and answer whether the reappointment of Ethan Shutt to the Permanent Fund Board is a positive, negative, or just another status quo development. And now let's join Michael. Truth Tuesdays is what we got here going on and we're ready to go. So, Brad, um, I mean, not to beat a dead horse, but some of these things keep coming back to us again and again and again. Uh, We'll start off here in hour one with uh, kind of uh, the Orwellian take uh, on language from uh, AK Fiscal and and, uh, give us give us this. The Orwellian Orwellianization is what you said in your email. And I was like, Wow, that's a word. I love it. Orwellianization. What do you you mean? Hit me with this. What are we talking about here? Well, it's a word that's easier to type than it is to pronounce. So as as I was typing it out, it made sense. Um, So Alaska, the Alaska fiscal situation has been characterized in a number of situations by changes in language. It's, It's if you can't change the law, change the language and 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 there's been two big uh uh changes that have that have occurred that that demonstrate that we're we're going through the second right now the first was in 2017 when they realized they weren't going to be and by they i mean natasha and bert and others realized they weren't going to be able to change the statute around the pfd what they did was a sleight of hand. They, they, they previously had characterized the PFD as designated general funds, uh, DGF. And that was the way in which it had shown up in the fiscal summaries for, for decades. But in 2017, realizing they weren't going to be able to change the statute that set aside uh, the PFD, all what they did was change the language and they recharacterized the PFD from designated general funds, which meant it was de- the, those funds were designated for a, for a specific purpose, set aside for that purpose. The legislature could go grab them. They can go grab any designated general funds, but, but they were still, they were on the books as set aside for a specific purpose. They recharacterized those as unrestricted general funds, UGF. And all of a sudden it was, oh, well, we can use those anytime we want for anything we want. They're unrestricted. Those PFD revenues are unrestricted general funds. And and we'll just, you know, start applying them across the board. Didn't change the statute, but changed changed the language around the statute. And what's really interesting is the language that's in the fiscal uh, summaries about defining what designated general funds are is still uh, there. Restricted revenue equals spending for each category. Designated, and this is from the most recent uh, uh, legislative finance fiscal summary. 
Designated general funds include, one, program receipts that are restricted to the program that generates the receipts. And the best example of that is university tuition, tuition paid for by university students. It's, gen it's actually you know, state money. It's paid to the state, but the state restricts it over to the use by the universities. And two, revenue, this is designated general funds, revenue that is statutorily designated for a specific purpose. That's the de definition of, of designated general funds. And PFDs, they haven't changed the statute. PFDs still fit that category, still fit that definition of designated general funds, revenue that is statutorily designated for a specific purpose. But they changed because they couldn't change the statute, because they couldn't undesignate those funds. They couldn't get enough votes to undesignate those funds. They just started calling them something else. They just changed the language. Unrestricted general funds. And that is the genesis for a lot of the of the of the issues that we've had since, because they're unrestricted general funds. We can apply them anything and we apply them anywhere. And, and we're just going to do that and ignore the statutory designation or as as Tim Bradner sometimes says, just just declare that uh, obsolete and just ignore it because it's because it's still on the books like any other statute that we're enforcing today. Uh, but it's obsolete because, you know, no, there's there's no longer um, uh, no longer fits the definition or something like that. We're going through the second phase of that, the second step of that right now. So we've got we've got all these funds. We've moved them from designated funds. We've redefined them as no longer meeting designated general funds for some reason. And we call them unrestricted general funds. And so so now we can spend them on anything. Now, what they're doing is they're beginning to, to realize that, oh, we've got money left over at the, at the end of appropriations. People are stopping short of appropriating all of the revenue they possibly could. They're holding back on revenue. But, but, but now they've got in the budget, they've got what some, some leftover money that, that statutorily, since it's coming from the PFD, statutorily should be paid to the PFD. It's not appropriated for anything else. Statutorily designated for the PFD should be paid to the PFD. Even after all the cuts, there's some left over. So now they've got some left over. And, and, and in order to avoid addressing the fact that it should be under the statutes and could be under the budget appropriated to the PFD, they're starting to call it surplus. And we've got this new category of surplus funds. Which is which is our funds that they've taken from the permanent fund dividend, they've moved over from the permanent fund dividend to, 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 the, to the general budget, but they haven't yet appropriated. And they're starting to and, and so they're starting to categorize them as surplus funds. And you see this legislative finance sent out a note, uh, sent out a newsletter uh, uh, last week that that includes, an abbreviated fiscal summary for what's been what's what's in the FY25 budget. And here and here's an interesting pair and here's a paragraph that is that is comparable to the paragraph we saw in 2017 that said all of a sudden does uh, uh, PFDs were no longer designated general funds. Based on the spring 2020 forecast, both the FY24 and FY25 budgets are projected to have surpluses 128.8 million and 146.5 million respectively. The FY24 uh, uh, surplus will lapse into the CBR, while any FY25 surplus will be available for appropriation next session. So basically what we're doing is we're overtaxing, overcutting the PFD now in order to create this, this slush fund that, 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 that we call surplus that will carry from one legis legislative session to the next and if it's not appropriate in the next legislative session, we'll go into the CBR. We're using excess PFD cuts now to start to start rebuilding the CBR. We've been doing that. We've been doing that all along. When you when you see the CBR uptick, it's really just excess PFD cuts that are showing up in there. But now they're trying to formalize that by creating this category called surplus. And it's also it's showing up in other strange ways. I mean. It's showing up as a rationalization for why the governor shouldn't be cutting things. For example, 
in an ADN editorial this weekend, the ADN says, this is about uh, the blood bank and, and Dunleavy's cuts to the blood bank. It says, Senator, Senator Kathy Giesel, a former nurse, said she had not heard a specific rational rationale at all about the cuts to the blood bank and pointed out the fact that insofar as, sa as savings and fiscal stability are concerned, the operating and capital budgets included a surplus before the governor got out his red pen. So there's a surplus. Why should the governor, why should the governor be cutting it? This, this is it's the same thing that we saw last year in an editorial by Elise Galvin talking about K through talking about the governor's budget uh, 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 vetoes, partial veto of the line item veto of K through 12 spending. And in, in her editorial, she said, and there's a budget surplus. So what's the hangout? So what we've got going on, Michael, is they can't change the statute. They can't get the votes to change the statute about the PFD. So what they, and by they, I mean legislative leadership, because Delana Johnson has been right in there with everybody else calling it a surplus. What they, the legislative leadership, are doing is changing the language. First, it's no longer designated general funds. It's unrestricted general funds. So, hey, we can spend it on anything. And now it's no longer excess PFD cuts or cuts or, or revenues that should have gone toward the pay to pay the PFD, all of a sudden it's surplus. And, and, and now we can, now we're just, now we can attack the governor for cutting spending by saying, Hey, there's a surplus. So, so what's the problem? It's, it's, it, it, it's Orwellian. I won't try Orwellianization because I'll blow that. It's Orwellian in the sense that they're changed. They can't change truth. They can't change the facts. They can't change the statute. They can't get the votes to change the statute. So they're just changing the language. Well, it's 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 kabuki theater, right? I mean, this is fiscal kabuki theater. Basically, they're doing what they're doing, and they're looking to, for a way to explain it to the average person who may understand the basics of a surplus versus a deficit versus, you know, things like that. And so they frame it in such a way that it looks like, Oh, it makes their position look very reasonable. We already had a surplus. Why would the governor cut more since we had a surplus? Do we need a surplus? I mean, we're just spending reasonably. We had a surplus. And they keep saying that. But, of course, nobody ever talks about, uh, you know, the, the first thing that they pick up at the beginning of the next year is the overspend from the previous year, right? I mean, there's always a... Uh, a, f a fiscal, uh, I've forgotten the word right off the top of my head here, but you know, the, <clears throat> by the way, we overspent from last year. So we need to true up last year. So how supplemental. Much yeah. Supplemental budget. There you go. Sorry. Uh, supplemental budget. So, I mean, you know, it's just another way for them to, like you said, capture the language or explain away and justify what they're doing and making it sound so, so reasonable. Right. They've used this kind of language in the past for different things, not just this time. But this is just another one where it's just so, so re it's like the idea of using designated funds versus dedicated funds because the dedicated funds are prohibited by the Constitution. But we can designate funds all we want. <laughs> it's the same kind of thing. Right. I mean, it's like, wait a second. What is that? And, and, then, and then even though they meet the definition of designated funds, we'll treat them as, as, as something else. It, it, it's, I mean, it's being used for other things. So you have candidates out there that are campaigning on the fact that there's a surplus. I not only balance the budget, but there's a surplus. So you got candidates out there claiming to be fiscal conservatives, claiming to be fiscal hawks when they've cut the PFD hugely um, uh, and and cut it even another $150 million in this case, another $150 million to create this surplus so they can go around campaigning on the fact and we have and we have a budget surplus. And then, as you say, when they get into the next session, they go, oh, heck, we had a surplus left over from, from, from last session. Um, and so, oh, we can spend that surplus because, you know, we got these extra funds that came in from the, right. from, from the last budget. And we can cut the PFD again so we can have more money in this session, but now we've, we we can use PFD cuts, excess PFD cuts we made in the last session. It is, it, it is, you know, I, for a while, I thought ledge finance uh, was going to sort of straighten out and, and play the game straight, but now they're in on it. I mean, this, 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 this recent fiscal note, this recent fiscal newsletter is coming from legislative finance and they're the ones that are explaining, oh, there's this surplus. Certainly they're doing it at a Burt's direction, but but they're right. still
you know it's uh <clears throat> curiouser and curiouser for sure uh it's uh it's that capturing of the language and again trying to explain away what they're doing and justify it i just love the 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 mental gymnastics you've got to go through to follow this stuff can't have dedicated funds, but we've got designated funds. And then when the designated fund part doesn't work out, we just redefine that as something else. And then we throw in new phrases that will confuse you, which we've never used before, this idea of a surplus. And now we'll justify everything we're doing by saying, he's not being reasonable because he's cutting and we already had a surplus. Um, you know, it's just, uh, again, it's it is. It's kabuki. They're shuffling stuff around and trying to justify to you how they're spending billions of dollars. Uh, and it's just oh so reasonable and we should just all get with the program, essentially. Well, why it's, is, it's why 1984. Is it's George Orwell. It is changing the language to 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 justify, you know, acts that that it's the use of the language that isn't normal use of the language to cover what they're doing. And and it's and and it's wrong. I mean, <laughs> I know there's only so many times I can say that, but 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 they are conveying a meaning to Alaskans that is not what they're actually doing. They're conveying the meaning that we're creating surpluses yep. that we have a surplus. It's not like oil prices went up to the point we have in the old use of the term, where we have a budget surplus, where we have more revenues from traditional sources than we than we can spend. It's and, and they ought to go to the SBR, they ought to go to the CBR. It's not like that. They're creating these additional revenues through deep PFD cuts, through deep cuts in something that's that's designated by by the statute. And then they're just calling it, they're calling that surplus. They're calling if you think of PFD cuts, uh as I know Randy doesn't, but if you think of PFD cuts in the way that Matt Berman thinks of them as taxes or as as takes of income. Uh, reductions in income from Alaska families, it's excess taxes. What they're doing is taking is making excess taxes taxes to create this surplus uh, uh, for for them to use for them to go campaign on and for them to use in, in in attacking the governor and for them to use in a subsequent budget cycle. Yeah, no, it's frustrating. Ben Carpenter said, "I thought the argument was that PFDs aren't affordable any longer, or was that the dividends should only be paid from surpluses, right?" I mean, this is the, it's, it gets so confusing in there. I mean, does is, nobody can kind of keep track what's going on, but the bottom line is, is that they're taking more money and that surplus should have gone to the people to begin with. And instead they're just overtaxing you and then justifying that money to then be used later on or to go back and pay the CPR. It basically prevents them from having to be fiscally responsible um, in the moment because they could pass everything on down the road, right? Yeah, and and what's when you think about it in the context of the CBR, that that the surplus then spills over to the CBR. What's really going on is we overspent, we way overspent in the early twenty teens. We 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 spent on roads, bridges. We spent on all sorts of different things in the early twenty twenty teens and drained the CBR. Now they're trying to pay the CBR back, but they don't want to pay it back from all of the Alaskans who benefited from that overspending, probably you know, 50% of whom have moved out of state by now. They don't want to pay it back from all of those Alaskans who benefited from the overspending. They want to pay it back from middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. So the top 20% oil and non-residents dodge again. So it, it's, it's, it's sort of, a, it's sort of this, this concept of surplus sort of cascades into, oh, and we get to keep taking more from middle and lower income Alaska families. And we get to keep taking more from middle and we get to overtax them more. It's just, it, it's capturing, it's using the language in a way that is not the common, ordinary, understood meaning of the terms. Well, again, it, it, it you know, the, the, and the thing is, this is all a justification. Like you said, you keep seeing it now in this idea, both uh, Elise Galvin, last year and uh and kathy geisel this year saying we've got a surplus why are they cutting we've got a surplus why are they cutting uh but it's a fictitious surplus that's basically been ginned up on the backs of alaskan people and that's why they're cutting and uh, and that's why some of these cuts are occurring but again it makes them sound oh so reasonable and that's where the danger is, I think, because the average person is not deep enough in the budget to understand these things. And he hears the word surplus and they're like, oh, OK, well, that makes sense. Yeah, we shouldn't cut. We've got a surplus. Why would we do that? Uh, you know, again, 
it's capturing that low information voter to basically make them understand it. Let's continue on here. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. The weekly top three continues. Uh, we're jumping into it now, revisiting something we uh, talked a little bit about last week, and that is the Alaska anomaly. Brad, remind us of what that was before we jump back into this here so that people can understand where we're at here. So the Alaska anomaly is, is that many consider us, most consider us a low tax or a no tax state, um, but we're losing population. The, when, when tax people do an analysis or when fiscal people in DC do an analysis, they explain the, the population shift that's going on in the country, the exit from New York, the exit from California, the growth in Florida, the growth in Texas. They explain that in terms of low taxes. They said, well, you have a low tax jurisdiction. And so that's attracting people from high tax jurisdictions. Well, on the standard they use, which is looking at the standard definitions of tax, income tax, sales tax, property tax, on the standard definitions they use, Alaska is a, virtually a no tax state. Uh, we have no sa statewide sales tax. We have no statewide income tax. We have no statewide property tax. Um, and as a consequence, we're, we're basically a no tax state. Yet, as we discussed last week, Alaska finishes in the bottom five in terms of migration patterns. Not only are people not coming to Alaska, they're leaving Alaska. Um, and, and so we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing this out migration. And to some degree, people have said, oh, this out migration is a temporary thing. It has to do with oil. It has to do with a bunch of other stuff. And, and we will turn around uh, at some point and we'll start having in migration again. Alaska will start growing the population. Well, as James Brooks reports in Alaska Beacon article, uh, la the, this this week, last week, um, that's not happening. The the demographers, how's that for a word? The demographers uh, at the Alaska Department of Labor have have issued a new update that says uh, that that predicts a population drop. the The headline on James's article is Alaska demographers predict population drop, a switch from prior forecasts. So now we're no longer saying trying to excuse this population shift as this 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 out migration that we've been having we're no longer trying to excuse it as a temporary thing now we're admitting it's a long term thing how how does that happen when you look at the when you look at the stuff that comes from DC how does that happen in a no tax state the 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 response has been the response is interesting to this to the Alaska uh, labor department uh, uh, publication you know, you've seen people say, well, we need more education spending. How are we going to stop this population, this, this out migration? We need more education set, uh, spending, say some Democrats. We need more energy subsidies, say some Republicans. We need more infrastructure, say both Democrats and Republicans. We need defined benefits, you know, government defined benefits to keep people in the state, says, says Kathy Giesel. But I don't think they're looking at this the right way. Let's go back to last week's analysis. Most when, when you look at low tax states, what's really going on is the low tax states have low government spend and they spread the burden, not the best way in the world. They, they, they spread it largely through sales and property tax, but they spread, spread the burden broadly so that at least it picks up some contribution from non-residents and at least it picks up some contribution from the top 20%. Um, and, and so you have a much a much lower per per capita or a much lower per person charge to to pay for government and government is lower spending in the first place. So you have a you have a low tax state because you're not the government's not spending a whole lot and it is it is it is spreading the burden broadly so that no one uh, given segment is is bearing a big share of it. That's the exact reverse from what's going on in Alaska. Alaska is actually when you look at it on a on a per capita basis or any sort of basis, it's a high spend state. Um, and, and, and we have high spending on a per capita basis. Now, people will rationalize that, that we're largely rural, we're a big state, we've got to, you know, things cost more, we got to spend more. But I don't, I don't care how you rationalize it. The fact is we're a high cost state. And unlike Florida and Texas, we're concentrating that burden. We're not spreading it across across all the population to, and including non-residents 
by having a broad-based a broad-based revenue source to cover that spending, we're concentrating it on middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. We're concentrating the burden on middle and lower income Alaska on 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 the middle those in the middle and lower income brackets, unlike the low tax states. So Alaska is doing the reverse. And guess what's happening as a result? We're losing people. We're losing people. And where are we losing people? We're losing people in, in the working age population. The, 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 those that are 60 and older, though that segment of Alaska is actually increasing. Population's actually increasing when you measure it by the number of in, in, income tax returns filed. It's it's that population is actually increasing. The decrease is going on in the middle and lower income brackets. Two hundred thousand dollars and below is where we're losing people that are age sixty um, and below. So we the Alaska anomaly is we have a we have what people think is a low tax state, and and but we're still losing people. But if you if you think through it, we're losing people because we're actually a high cost, high tax state. We are, from the perspective of middle and lower income Alaska families, we are the equivalent of California or New York because we're putting the entire fiscal burden on them. It shouldn't be any surprise that we're losing people. It shouldn't be any surprise that we're going to continue to lose people, that we're going to continue on this downward spiral as long as we as long as we have high government costs and we continue to put them entirely on middle and lower income Alaska families, those people are going to continue to leave. And that's and 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 that's that's what explains the Alaska anomaly. It's not, oh, we need more education spending, or we need more energy subsidies, say George Rauscher and other Republicans, or we need more infrastructure, or we need more defined benefits. It's not any of the mores, it's the less. Right. And it's the spread the burden broadly, as opposed to concentrating it on middle and lower income Alaska families. And this is, again, part of the problem of why it's driving it out. Uh, Donna said uh, earlier, Donna Ardwin said her firm uh, shows the absolute correlation between uh, taxes and out migration. Alaska is recognized as a high tax state. Wait until you add an income tax or something else, and then that exodus will actually speed up. We talked about that previously. It's like the doom loop, right? I mean, once you reach that point of, and that's what like California and New York, that's what they're experiencing at this point. And Alaska, if the spending continues without any you know, capping or anything else, this is what we're going to see here is a continual out migration that will actually increase. But we're already seeing it, Michael, and we're see- and we and and we don't have. I mean, it's those people who understand what PFD cuts are do see it as a high tax state. But generally speaking, when you go to the Tax Foundation and the other uh, national institutes that look at ITEP and other national institutes that look at Alaska, they call it a low tax state. And 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 you, you talk to legislators, and they'll say, "Oh, it's a low tax state. We have no tax. We have no statewide taxes. We need to keep it that way," says Zach Fields or Andy Josephson. Um, uh, that's what we, that's what we need. We need to spend more, but we need to keep it a low tax state. How do we do that? We use it by calling things surpluses and, and unrestricted general funds. And we start, and we take money out of the pockets of, of, of middle and lower income Alaska families. And they're showing us how they react to that. They're leaving. That's what the numbers show. So, you know, it, you, you, you cannot, it, it is, it, it, the Alaska anomaly is explained by the fact it's not an anomaly. The Alaska anomaly that some people say is the Alaska anomaly is a low tax state, but we're still losing population. Well, it's not an anomaly because we're not a low tax state. We are when you take into account the PFD and the burden that puts on middle and lower income Alaska families, we're actually a very high tax state in 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 the in league with California and New York and the other states that are losing losing population. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. So, Brad, how do we overcome this? I mean, because, again, now they're this James Brooks article talks about now they're no longer looking at these rosy forecasts. They're saying that by 2050, we'll have, uh, you know, another 30,000 or so uh, fewer residents than we did uh, that we, you know, that we do today. And it's just going to continue that out. Migration is going to continue. So what what's it take to tip the tip the balance back the other way? We have we have politicians and policymakers like Ben Carpenter who call who call the truth the truth. 
and say, look, we do have taxes. We do have burdens. We do. We are taking revenue from, from segments of the Alaska population. We need to spread that out more broadly to lower the impact on the people who are leaving, uh, to, to lower the impact on middle uh, and lower uh, income Alaska families. And in doing that, we're also going to generate pushback on additional government spending because government spending will no longer be free to the those in the top 20% and non-residents and the oil companies. That's the way you do it. You 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 admit you 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 admit what PFD cuts are, you admit they are burdens, taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families. You say we can't concentrate that burden because they're leaving. Not we don't need to spend more, take more from them in order to create more toys out there in terms of higher K through 12 and, and other things. We don't need to increase the burden on them. We need to lower the burden on them in two ways. One, by spreading that burden to include people who are getting off, currently getting off in Governor Hammond's term, scot-free. And second, we need to then start reducing the burden on everybody as happens in actual low tax states. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, uh, that's number two. Give us a tease for number three. Number three is, what is number three? No, number three is, does Ethan Schutt's reappointment to the Permanent Fund Board uh, put the PFD, put the Permanent Fund Board back on the right track? All right, we continue here in just a moment. Brad Keithley continues with us again for the weekly top three and two Tuesdays. We'll be back with more in just a moment. Don't go anywhere. The Michael Duke Show, common sense, liberty-based, free thinking radio. If you missed the show, you can listen to it on your time with Dukes On Demand. Oh, and it's free. Like America used to be. Streaming live every weekday morning on Facebook Live and MichaelDukesShow.com. Ben Carpenter says, um, so we're both, we're now, we're both a low tax state and a high spend state, but are we a prosperous state? And, uh, I mean, that's the, that's the million dollar question. And I think the answer to that is pretty much at this point, no, because we know where this is going to all end up in the long run. I mean, and, right. And, and the answer is we aren't a low tax state. The low tax state should have had quotes around it. We aren't a low tax state. We right. are a high tax. When you look, when you take into account PFD cuts, we are a high tax state and start that those high taxes are, are high takes of revenue. If, if, if I'm, if I'm dealing with Randy, those high takes of revenue are coming from middle and coming from a targeted segment of the population, middle and lower income Alaska families. And when you look at who's who, where the my, out migration is occurring, it's middle and lower income Alaska families at working age, middle and lower income Alaska families. So low, low tax state should be in quotes. Yeah, no, it should be. Uh, he also said, so rather than a permanent fund earnings flowing into the private economy, it's flowing. This is on his pre on your previous comment. It's flowing into the CBR. So it's like the private economy doesn't matter to some, which again, this, I mean, this is the whole point, right? The private economy, as long as the public economy is protected and they have those monies from the fund and they can get the fund up to a hundred million dollars, a hundred billion dollars. So they can just draw, you know, Nothing else matters at that point. As long as they can get their 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 kick and their their uh, chunk of money, it's all good. And, and, and that's I mean, it's coming back into the Alaska anomaly, Michael. I mean, we got declining population. Ooh, we need to spend more. <laughs> we need to spend more on K through twelve. We need to drive this stake deeper into the ground. Where's that money going to come from? It's going to come from middle and lower income Alaska families. And we and, and who's leaving? Middle and lower income. We need to drive that stake until these guys until they're gone, until we've turned this state into a you know a high income haven uh, for for you know. Well, it's a high income haven of government only employees because they're the only ones that can re remain, and whatever service industry can service them, and the rest of it's just like there you go. I mean, you know, where do you go from there? Right. I mean, what once you've got nothing but government employees because they're the only ones that can afford to stay and the service industries that keep them. It's almost like because, again, the fewer people that are here, the less services the state has to provide and they could just keep going. You know, it, it it's frustrating. Kyle, the more, the more services they the more services they can provide, the more employees they need to provide 
fewer to, to less yeah. people, right? We can have more K through 12 for you know 50% less people for, for more less people. And then Kyle says CBR payback is a constitutional requirement, is a constitution no longer. Nobody's saying not to pay back the CBR, Kyle, but that again, that's a whole other kettle of fish. Where is the rest of that money going to come from? I mean, we owe it what I think seven billion or eight billion dollars at this point. It's supposed to have a 10 billion dollar balance, and I mean. So nobody said not to pay it, but I mean, it, this is not a, this is not a dig at not putting money in the CBR. This is kind of this fictitious shell game that they're playing with the finances to show, oh, well, if, if we don't use it, it'll go into the CBR. I, I've been one of the biggest advocates, and Kyle knows this, I've been one of the biggest advocates of paying back the CBR. I've written article after article, commentary after commentary about the need to pay back the CBR. But we need to pay back the CBR from the people who benefited from the from the from the top 20 percent, from the non-residents, from all those people who got the benefits of taking down the CBR in the early 20, uh, 20 teens. And, and what we're doing with this surplus is we're paying it it's sneakily. We're paying back the CBR from middle and lower income Alaska families through deeper PFD cuts, excess PFD cuts. And I, yeah, I absolutely, we need to pay back the CBR, but we need to pay back, pay it back from the people who benefited, or at least the, since 50% of those people are gone from the early 20 teens because of the out migration, we need to pay it back at least from, um, at least from the same income brackets that got the benefits uh, of, of that, of that massive spending that occurred in the, in the early 20 teens. I'm, I, Kyle and I have these half arguments. It's yes, absolutely. We need to pay back the CBR, but we need to, but it's who we need to pay back the CBR from well, who needs be. to contribute to that process. That's the issue. Right. It's a broad thing. You can't just continue to hang the burden on the lower income, you know, the lower 80% middle, or, middle yeah. and lower income. Yeah. I mean, well, you, you just, you just can't keep hanging the, the bill on them and then expect it's all going to be, uh, you know, uh, gr gravy. Everybody's got to pay, to pay that back. We all quote unquote benefited from it. Uh, so we should all have to pay it back together, I guess, uh, which is the more frustrating thing. Um, all right, let's see. Um, like Gary says, this is beating a dead horse by saying, taking the PFD is a tax on middle and lower income families. Everybody here already agrees saying this here week after week goes nowhere. But the thing is we may agree with it, but you know, not everybody else is understanding that. That's the problem. Here on the program, we may understand that, you know, deeply and 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 agree with it. But the problem is not everybody is in agreement with that. No, not a lot of a lot of mainstream people, you know, just regular folks who are not paying attention to this, they don't know that, Gary. That's the problem. Um, and that's why I think Brad keeps repeating it over and over and over again. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is uh, our guest. We continue with the weekly top three on this Truth Tuesday. The final one is the discussion on the Permanent Fund Board. This has been a topic on and off for weeks here on the program with all the different fervor that's going on over the the permanent fund and and uh you know unethical behavior and ignoring the 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 legislature and all the other things that are going on but don't worry the governor is now reappointed uh, uh shoot back to the uh, thing is this a, is this a good thing or a bad thing Brad uh what where are we at so we so one of the things that in the leaked emails uh, from from the permanent fund staff was an email that said that Ellie Rubenstein, who's vice chair of the board, currently the vice chair of the board, Ellie Rubenstein had said that uh, the staff should know that that the governor won't be reappointing Ethan Shutt, who was the who was the chairman of the board, and and since Ellie's the vice chair of the board, uh, one would think that she said that in order to give them some indication that she was likely to ascend to chair. That Ethan wasn't going to be reappointed, that and that she was going to have more complete control of the board than she had, uh, even at that point. So, you know, go talk to my, go talk to the people I want you to talk to. Was was sort of the sort of the rollout uh, of that string of uh, that string of emails. Ethan's term, Ethan has been chair of the of the permanent fund board. Ethan's term expired on June thirtieth, uh, and unlike other state agencies. Uh, or state positions, you don't carry over uh, a a, a a board member on the permanent fund board doesn't carry over past the end of the term 
uh, until his successor is appointed. The end of his term means the end of the person's term means the end of the person's term. And when we got to June 30th, the governor hadn't, appoint, hadn't appointed anybody. He hadn't reappointed Ethan. He hadn't appointed anybody else to take that seat. And so Ellie is vice chair all of a sudden became acting chair because, because she was the vice chair. And there was a lot of speculation about what the heck the administration was 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 doing now. Were they going to try to leave that seat vacant in order so Ellie could just you know automatically roll up to chair? Uh, that didn't seem like a good idea after all of the after all the chaos that she had caused earlier in the year. Uh, but but what were they going to do? Last week, the governor finally acted and reappointed without any discussion, without any explanation posted on the on the on the state website that Ethan had been reappointed uh, as as a as a director of the of the permanent fund board. Um, and that doesn't mean he's chairman. The governor doesn't name the chairman. The permanent fund board members elect the chairman, but at least that part of Ellie's uh, predictions uh, didn't come to pass and the governor reappointed. Now the question is, okay, does that mean we're does that mean the permanent fund board is now back on an even keel? We can stop worrying about it. All's right with the world and everything, everything is going to be hunky dory from here on in. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Uh, first, uh, it's not automatic that Ethan continues as chairman. Plus, Ethan's been is has been outvoted. He and Craig Richards have been outvoted four to two. Uh, on a number of recent initiatives with Ellie leading the uh, the four against Ethan's two. So just because he's back on the board, A, doesn't mean he's chairman and what with whatever power that has. And B, it, do, it doesn't mean that, that, that the votes are going to go any different because the four, Ellie and, uh, and the three commissioners, uh, well, two commissioners appointed by Dunleavy plus Jason Bruni, uh, it doesn't mean that they're going to change uh, their their voting pattern. So it, it it doesn't mean that. What it what it means is it didn't get worse. He didn't appoint another sycophant. Sycophant. There we go. There's an N in there. Sycophant. He didn't appoint another sycophant on the board uh, to to go along with Ellie. That Ethan has stood up to Ellie in the past, and and presumably may continue to do so. And he and the governor didn't appoint another sycophant on the board that would just vote with Ellie and make these into five one votes as opposed to as opposed to four two votes. So in some sense, it sort of stops the bleeding where it was. We're still bleeding, but but we're not bleeding further. But I would argue it also passes up an opportunity actually to make the board better. As we've right. talked about, as we've talked about on the show before, in other jurisdictions. The requirement for a board member in like Texas, Texas has two permanent funds in Texas. Uh, the, the requirement for a board member is they have a substantial background and expertise in investments, the very business that these permanent fund boards are in. We don't have that requirement in Alaska. And 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 Ethan is really just another sort of broad based community member. He doesn't have any special expertise in investments or in or in or in the investment industry or how to make investments. And, and so the governor had an open seat. He could have appointed somebody who actually had substantial background and expertise in investments, could have, could have progressed the board by doing that, um, but he chose not to. So, so we've sort of stopped the bleeding in a way. We still have a four to two majority that goes against Ethan and Craig Richards. Uh, we that, that follows Ellie. We, we've, we've sort of stopped the bleeding and that it's not going to get worse. It doesn't go to five one. Uh, but we but he passed up an opportunity to make it better. And so I think I, I don't think this is this is an indication that we're going back to back to the good times or, or back to where we were or or that we stop need to stop worrying about the permanent fund board. I think it means that we've still got big worries just not bigger worries maybe than what we right. had before. I mean, he had an opportunity here if he had put, because obviously Ellie has, uh, she has uh, some background in uh, investing and things like that. He had the opportunity to put somebody on the board who also had uh, investment experience and things like that and could be a counter to her arguments from that perspective. But instead he just put shoot back in there. And, and uh, so it's kind of a status quo. It's not good. It's not bad. I mean, it's not better. It's not worse. It's just kind of continuing on, which seems to be a habit of what we've got going on here. 
That's a great point, Michael. I mean, people sometimes say, well, the permanent fund board isn't responsible for much. But but one of the things they always outline the permanent fund board is responsible for is, is allocating investments in, in categories. Annually, they step back and they say, how much do we want in fixed in fixed return? How much do we want in, in opportunity return, private equity and those sorts of things? How much do we want in the stock market? That's a huge decision. And it really takes investment understanding to, to understand what those allocations ought to be. And that's that's one thing the board does. Right now, Ellie, I mean, as you point out, Ellie's the only one on the board who really has experience background in that. I mean, Ryan Anderson, who's the commissioner of transportation, is on the board, has no experience in that. Adam Crum would tell you he does, but he doesn't. Jason Bruni, I don't know what Jason Bruni would tell you, but he doesn't. Craig Richards doesn't really have that background either. And, and Ethan doesn't. So it really leaves Ellie as the only one who's really had some some familiarity with that. So when she speaks, she's got the authority of somebody who actually does have does have some of that background. And you know, she's got her father's with whispering in her ear also as 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 background to that. Um, we need we need a counterweight. It would it would have been great to have a counterweight to that uh, on the board, but the governor passed up the opportunity, leaving Ellie essentially as the only voice that has experience in the area. And as we've talked about in the past, and I think as Kyle uh, mentions here in the chat room as well, the entire statute needs to be rewritten, that we must have legislative confirmation. Should we be just basically be rewriting a requirement for board members that they have some experience like the Texas statute that you were just quoting? Absolutely. I mean, we've talked about it on the show. I've written columns on it that Kyle may or may not have read. Uh, I've written columns on on that we need to be restructuring the board to include legislative confirmation, but legislative confirmation itself is not enough. We need to restructure the requirements of the board to match what you see in other sovereign wealth funds, to match what you see in Texas, to match what you see in New Mexico, to match what you see in Norway, to match what you see in Saudi. We need to rewrite the requirements so that the members have substantial uh, experience and, and knowledge about about investments, about the very thing that, that that's going on. Maybe one or two members uh, uh, from the community to sort of add a community gloss on that, uh, a, 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 a test, a community test would be useful, but we need people on there who really understand the in investment community and are good supervisors right. of those who are making these, these decisions. So yes, we need to re rewrite the statute. We need to restructure the board to include legislative confirmation, but that's not enough. We need to re rewrite the requ requirements as well. We definitely need to counterweight for what Ellie's doing. I mean, I think that is, uh, I, I think, you know, I think that's important, you know, like hire professionals perish the thought that we should hire professionals in this, uh, in that industry or in that business who understand it. Ben just kind of highlights what I was just saying there at the end. Recent reallocation towards more private equity investment means increased risk that fund income will be inadequate to meet earnings draws in the future, all in an effort to grow the fund to $100 billion as soon as possible. Slow and steady wins the race was the, was really the, the theme of the permanent fund for decades. And now it's like, oh, we need to get that $100 billion mark. So how do we do it quickly, even though there's a higher risk factor involved and everything else? Because again, that is the ultimate goal, right? $100 billion means they can ignore everything else in the state just to spin off what they need. You know, Michael, I, I'm, I've started to, to wonder if that's really the goal. I mean, the hundred billion, they're explaining the hundred billion dollars in a way that that is part of the piece of the rationalization for unifying the earnings reserve and the and the permanent fund corpus. It's it's being used as, oh, we need to unify the two together because that'll enable us, that's part of what will enable us to grow it to a hundred billion dollars, and that'll you know enable the top 20% to live rent-free forever and ever in the oil companies and, and the non-residents to, to live rent-free forever and ever. That's part of the rationalization. But really. What, what the whole unification of in, in what I'm increasingly understanding is the unification of the earnings reserve and the permanent fund corpus is really just to provide access to the permanent fund corpus so that when we get to the end of, of the of permanent fund dividend cuts, you know, most people say, well, we're going to go to taxes or when, when we run out of the permanent fund dividend, most people say we're going to go to taxes. If you unify the earnings reserve and the permanent fund corpus, what you've really set up is you can just kick over and start drawing down the corpus. 
because you've set up a, a you, 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 there's not a stop there. You don't run out of the earnings at some the earnings reserve at some point and have to stop drawing. You can just keep drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing once you once you make that unification. So I'm I'm curious whether the hundred billion I, I'm 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 increasingly skeptical whether the hundred billion is is an objective in and of, of it itself or it's just an excuse to do the unification of the two funds and and set up the ability to draw down the permanent fund oh. corpus as a way of continuing to avoid taxes going that, on into the future. That's an interesting take because, and that would actually play into their modus operandi of not having a long-term fiscal plan as long as they get theirs while they're here and it's in their lifetime or in their, you know, then they can retire and move away or whatever else. They don't care. I mean, if they draw down the permanent fund, then, and they don't have to pay the consequences down the road and they could still be the heroes for avoiding taxes, right? Because now they could say, well, we don't want taxes. We'll just overdraw the permanent fund uh, until it, you know, until they draw that down to nothing. Um, I mean, you could be right. It, you, I mean, I could be wrong where I said, I think if there's going to be taxes, you know, a discussion on taxes in three years, you're right. Maybe they avoid that whole discussion. And with all the Republicans who are like, I'd rather have no permanent fund than taxes. Um, the thing is, then they don't know that we're eating our seed corn and what it'll do is create an even bigger problem down the road. And, and what we'll do is we'll create a new word, just like we just like the permanent fund dividends are no longer designated. All of a sudden, by magic, they're unrestricted. And just like uh, just like, you know, excess permanent fund dividend cuts, excess PFD cuts are now surplus. We'll create a, They'll create a new word to 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 Orwellianize the drawdown of the permanent fund corpus. I, I think I think the real driver, in all honesty, the more I think about this, the more time I spend with these issues, the more I understand the motivations, think about the motivations of the various actors in this. I think the real driver at the end of the day is, is for the top 20%, the oil industry and, non and the non-resident industries, tourism, fishing, to avoid taxes at all costs. And that explains why we drained the CBR or the SBR. That explains then why we've drained the CBR. That explains why we're draining permanent fund dividends. And I don't think it stops when we get to the end of permanent fund dividends. I think the unification, I think, I think the key, the key to understanding Alaska's future is this whole debate about the unification of the earnings reserve and the permanent fund corpus. And I think if they, in, in all of the arguments are really around trying to get those two unified. So once they're unified, then you can draw down the permanent fund corpus. Then you've set up the ability to draw down the per permanent fund corpus. And I think, you know, Burt's movement of $8 billion out of the earnings reserve over to the, the permanent fund corpus so we could claim there's an earnings reserve crisis uh, out there. I think that was part of it. Uh, I think the $100 billion, frankly, is, is probably part of it. It's all to set up a situation where the top 20%, this generation's top 20%, and the next generation's top 20%, the oil companies and the non-resident industries never have to contribute. It's all taken off the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. I mean, <laughs> that's a, it's spooky, but um, I, again, I have often said and been saying for 25 years on this program that the main goal is to get to the corpus, that the corpus is the piggy bank that they cannot help but look at adoringly and say, this is what we really need, is we really need to get our hands on that. So you're right. I mean, if they do, or if they are able to combine the funds, that will be the next step, um, is uh, probably to drain that down because, hey, I don't have to take care of it. If they, if they drain it an extra billion dollars a year, what do they get? Another 40 years out of it before their earnings start really, you know, uh, are they able to, to do that? I mean, possibly. Uh, if they're eating into it a billion dollars a year as it goes forward and it remains steady, um, that's a, I mean, that's a scary proposition right there. I, and I, and I think the permanent fund board is playing a, is, you know, part of creating this crisis around the earnings reserve to justify the unification of the two funds. I think the permanent fund board is in on this. And, and that's why you don't want somebody with investment experience in there because they'll understand it and say, wait, 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 that's not what we're supposed to be doing. So I, I, uh, the hundred billion, the hundred billion dollars, I've become skeptical of as as a target in and of itself. If it, if yeah. it is, it's only to get there so we can slide backwards. Well, that uh, thanks for that load of 
great stuff. Um, all right, Brad, well, we got about just over 90 seconds here, so I'll give you a chance to finalize and, and, and sum up your thoughts for the, all three of the weekly top threes today, weave them together and give me the answer here. What's the theme? The theme is, I think that, that we are ignoring reality. We're using words, uh, to, uh, to ignore reality. We're calling things that are excess cuts surpluses. Now we call them they used to be designated. Now we call them unrestricted. Uh, we we are changing the we they, we can't change this. They can't change the statute, so they're changing the language uh, instead. The Alaska anomaly uh, isn't really an anomaly once you truly understand what's going on. That we're putting that we are a high tax state. The high tax is on is on middle and lower income Alaska fam families. Eighty percent of Alaska families, and they're the ones leaving. And, and of course, the fact is, is that the permanent fund, as it continues this way, uh, is endangering the permanent fund. I mean, that's the thing in the long run, the permanent fund and the dividend itself, uh, very dangerous. And of course, does it play into their whole point of wanting to make sure that they get that hundred billion dollars so they don't have to worry about anybody else? You know, the private sector doesn't matter. Um, that's a bigger question, I guess, for another day. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. The weekly top three. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.